this sermon probably doesn't apply to anybody here today because I'm talking about getting old. And it's very difficult in America today to find somebody that's really old. But in one sense, it does apply to everybody because we're all going to get old. And I think it ought to be our aspiration to make getting older count so that when we are old, that we become elders and the kind of elders it talks about in the Bible. But how old is old? I mean, is... 30s old, when I was younger, don't trust anybody over 30. So 30 and up was old when you were not 30. And then I saw Chris get to be 30, and I realized 30 is pretty doggone old. No, <laughs> you can get old at 30. But uh, a child, you know, a dad in his 30s, man, that's... They're adults. I mean, they're authority figures in your 30s. You never may have thought of yourself in your 30s as an authority figure, but wow. Then you hit 40. And at 40, you get presbyopia. Ah. Elder presby, elder opia. Eyes. So you get old eyes. And all of a sudden, uh, I who have uh, extreme nearsightedness, all of a sudden can't read as close as I could. You know, you start, and presbyopia is not really about your eyes. It's really that somewhere or the other, the tendons in your arm are shrinking up, so you can't hold stuff as, quite as far away. Uh, and then you go to things like this where you can scale up uh, so that you're not carrying one of these big... Uh, uh, large print, extra giant print Bibles around. Uh, even pulpit Bibles don't quite have the size. Or you start printing bulletin notes in a size you can read from the back of the room. Uh, what about 50s? You get into your 50s and okay, you're beginning at that point to recognize that there is a definite terminus point to this. There's a, a, a point to where you know, if you're 50 and you're not thinking about doing something for the next generation, you're not bright enough to have made it to 50. You know, if you get to be 50, you begin to think about somebody else is going to have to take this thing at some point. Uh, and you need to be working with the next generation. What about 65? In our society, if you're 65 and up, you are older. You're not just a senior citizen. Uh... AARP started that when you're 50. I started getting insulting letters when I was 50 and uh, invited me to join the Associ American Association of Retired People with a lot of money to invest in uh, lobbyists who are going to do what they want to do. Anyway, that's a whole other subject. But what is old? Well, in the Bible, it talks about elders. Now, it talks about men elders and women elders. Uh, the problem, of course, is women elders don't stick because nobody will ever confess that they're an older woman. And older women should teach, older, teach younger women how to be godly women because older men can't teach that. Older men can teach younger men how to be godly men because we've been that trail. We kind of know where you're walking. We remember what it was like to be young. We remember the struggles there. We've come through some of them, and we're, we're at the place where we can begin to hopefully uh, indicate to somebody this is the path you ought to walk in. At what point do you become an elder? Well, it's not so much about chronological age as it is about a quality of life that you have. Look at the book of Titus, chapter 1, and you will find some of these requirements beginning in verse 5. He says, for this reason I left you in Crete was that to that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So here's an appointed position that requires some qualifications. By the way, there's a list in 1 Timothy 3. I'm just choosing to read the one in Titus because we're generally more familiar with the one in 1 Timothy 3. But he says, an elder must be blameless. Well, that's hitting you right between the eyes right at the start, isn't it? You've got to be blameless, faithful to his wife, 
A man whose children believe and are not open, and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient, since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, and not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Now, that not only is listing the qualifications for an elder, it's also setting a goal for us as men. This is what you need to move towards. This is what God wants you to become. He wants you to become this kind of person, this kind of a man. Here's the checklist. Here's the things to be working on. If you want to be a godly man, as God wants you to be, you need to move in this direction. Now, you can get older and not become an elder. But being an elder is not only a goal in life for you as a man, in this case, but also it is a responsible position in the church. Now I want you to turn with me back to the book of Acts, chapter 20. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn to Acts, chapter 20. Paul is on his final leg of his missionary journey going to Jerusalem, and he's in a bit of a hurry because he's got a time limit. And so verse 17 says, Acts chapter 20, verse 17, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. And when they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. In other words, he's saying, You have seen my life. Paul is writing here, speaking to them here as an elder. You have watched how I live, and he has collected the elders from the church. Now look down at verse 28. Acts 20, 28, he says, So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as elders. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we come into your presence, desiring, Lord, to learn, desiring, Father, that your Holy Spirit would make our life to be what you've described. Father, we're under no illusions that this is an easy task, that this is something that we can do on our own. Lord, that we'll have this ability, and Father, it just takes some extra effort. Father, we recognize that for us to understand this, but more importantly, O oh Lord, for us to live it out, it's going to require your Spirit working in our life. And so, Father, we come before you confessing that need, confessing that desire, and looking, Father, for you to accomplish in us what we cannot accomplish in ourselves. Open our minds. Teach us, O oh Lord, your way. And we ask this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. A lot of people misunderstand what I'm about to teach you. So I want to take you to this passage, Acts chapter 20. I want you to understand that there are three things that are described here that are really describing one office in the church. It was an essential office because remember he told Titus, I left you to, to do what was left undone. What was left undone? Well, what was left undone was the organizing of the churches there. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, we see that these elders are what is called overseers. Look at verse 28. He said, keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That is, those who are to be 
the watchers, the people are going to visit, the people are going to look into and care for the members of the church. He's likening the church to a flock of sheep. Now, if you know anything about sheep, that's not a flattering analogy. Sheep are skittish, stupid, uh, panicky, and messy animals. So when he says we're a flock, we're like a flock, I'm hoping he's indicating there are certain key analogies that, and those aren't the ones that he's looking at. He's looking at it from the point of view of sheep can't make it on their own. They've got to have somebody to look out for them. Sheep are not the kind of animals that you can leave on a hillside. You almost have to have somebody with them all the time if you're going to really be successful in raising sheep. You need somebody who will visit them. The word is episkopos. Uh, If you've ever heard of the Episcopal Church, well, it comes from this word. This is one of the words that describes the task of an elder. It is describing that which is the responsibility of overseeing what's going on in the church. He also uses the word shepherding, which is the word to pastor. It be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So the idea is that these elders are to oversee the church acting as a shepherd or a pastor of the church. So I would suggest to us that when we see the terms elder or overseer or shepherd, that we think about this in terms of this is the pastoral ministry of the church. Now, we have an immediate prejudice when I say that because you can only have paid pastors. And you have to go to seminary and you have to get degrees and you have to do it. No, The work of the elder in the church is the pastoral work of the church. Whether you have the title the pastor or a pastor, when we talk about elders, we're talking about the same thing. Sometimes this word overseer is described as bishop. And so through church history, we've had the development of elders and bishops and pastors. And well, pastors should be over, no, bishops should be over pastors And then you've got a bunch of bishops, so you need somebody that's higher a bishop, so we have an archbishop. And you've got all of this trickle-down structure. That's not what this is talking about. He's calling the elders of these churches. And by the way, in those days, the elder of a church, you didn't have a building. So the elders were people generally who would have the church meet in their house. How many people could you have meet in your house? Well, it depends on how big your house is, isn't it? Some groups were pretty small. I mean, a lot of homes, you get 12, 14 people in a home, that's a pretty good-sized bunch of folks. I mean, if somebody gets up, everybody else has got to watch out because, you know, you could get stepped on in most homes. Some people could have 50 people in a home. I can have 50 people in my home as long as they all keep moving. As long as they keep circulating, we can do 50 because, but you can't sit down. You know, you've got to stir them up occasionally uh, to get them to move around. Uh, But the idea was these were men who took care of a, a select group of people who met together regularly and he was looking out for their souls. He was watching out for them. He was doing the pastoral work of those people. You can be a pastor of a church. You can be an elder of a church. You can be an overseer in a church. You can be a bishop in a church. What's your job? Well, it might be teaching Sunday school. It might be looking out for a small group of people whom you have in your home or you go to their home and you're doing those kind of things. There's all kinds of division of this pastoral ministry of taking care of the flock of God. And that's what these people were doing. So when Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5 to the elders, he's writing to those who have been charged with taking care of, pastoring, overseeing the church of God. He's not writing to some group of lay leaders. 
Uh, we have the responsibility for the business of the church. He's taking care of, and I mean by business, the financial records and that kind of thing. He's saying, oh, no, you got responsibility for a lot more than that. You're responsible for the souls of the people that are under you. When you read the term elder in the New Testament, think pastoral ministry, whether it's pastors or not. Anybody that's doing that pastoral ministry is doing the work of shepherding, doing the work of an overseer in the church. Now, let's go to 1 Peter 5 and read our text today so we can begin to see what God is talking to us about. And uh, while you're turning there, I'll be turning to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. And we'll read our text this morning. I say all that to get to this passage. To the elders among you, not just the older, but the elders, these who have this position, I appeal as a fellow elder. Peter is an apostle. But he said, I have fellowship with you in this pastoral ministry. And a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. What's he saying to do? Verse 2, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Three basic things he's talking about admonishing these elders to do. And then verse 4, And when Christ, the chief shepherd, appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. I would encourage you as you're looking at the text to look at verse 1 and look at verse 4. And the see in verse 1 he starts talking about the share of the glory to be revealed. And in verse 4 he comes back and he talks about when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that will never fade away. It begins in glory and ends in glory, and in between are three or six admonitions, depending on how you're looking at them, that depend on whether you're going to have a share of this glory. Now, what are the three? Well, let me set one more thing in context that's in your bulletin, and I don't have a slide for this, so just I just want to mention to you, remember the whole context of 1 Peter is the context of suffering? He's not saying be an elder of the church when everything's great. He's saying you really need elders in the church when the church is going through suffering. When you're going through suffering. Because the context is suffering goes with the job of pastoring a church, of caring for the needs of people in the church, of looking out. Listen, if you want to see suffering, come on Wednesday night. Awana leaders just caught that. <laughs> but you, your responsibility is to pastor, to shepherd, to care for, to oversee that little flock that gathers around you, that little group that you're discipling by listening to their verses and making sure they understand what those verses mean and that they're learning how to apply those verses in the suffering situations you're going through. To be honest, how many of you who are my age and up if there is anybody older than me that would confess, would say, you know, I just really, if I could go back and be in elementary school again, it was such a wonderful experience. I would just love to go back. Anybody? Uh, one hand. One hand back there. Uh, I see some older people that are looking and saying, not even if I was physically fit would I want to go through that again. We won't skip ahead to the teen years, but aren't you glad to be out of high school and to have your permanent record clear? <laughs> what seems such a big deal to teachers, I've never had anybody ask to see my permanent record. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, huh? But he's saying here, you know, you've got a group that you're to care for. There are three things, they're suffering, you're suffering, three things you need to do. Number one, you need to watch your attitude. Watch your attitude, verse 2. Be shepherds of God's flock, be pastoring God's flock that is under your care, watching over them not because you must, but because you're willing 
as God wants you to be. Not begrudgingly, as it says in one translation, not with an unwilling attitude. A person that has an unwilling attitude views the job as an intrusion on their day. Oh, no. I've got to talk to that person. Oh, my. I had so many other things I wanted to do. Now, if you call me and ask me the stupid question, and I'll tell you right up, that this is, Pastor, are you busy? Pastor tries to stay busy. I've always got something to do, something I could be doing, something I could be writing. I try to fill my time. I, I very seldom sit there like this with my hand on the phone just hoping. Oh, there it's finally it rang. You're the first caller. No, that's not, not my life. That's the life of somebody on the radio uh, no, that's not it. I've always got something to do, but I don't have anything to do more important than to talk to you. With the possible exception of do I have so-and-so's address. But, you know, otherwise, if you want to call and talk to me, I'm willing to talk to you. I've got one of those phones now that I don't even have to answer. It answers for me. And maybe I'm not available because if I'm talking to somebody else, I will not answer my phone. That's just rude. I'm going to let it ring, going to let it go. I'm going to hit that little button and let it go to vibrate. And I'll call you back when I'm free. But otherwise, I'm pretty well engaged in that. People have to be the priority. Now, there will be some times when if people become priority enough, you're going to have to prioritize and go somewhere where people aren't so that you can pray and so that you can study the scriptures. But that's okay. The important thing is these people are more important than anything else. They are the ministry. Sometimes we'll say in Awana, Awana is a great program if it wasn't for all these kids. <laughs> yeah, not really. Uh, it really is sort of a pointless program without the kids. We have to recognize that's where the priority is. You know, Sunday school would be a really great thing if you didn't have people in there asking questions. No, that's not the point. The point is the people are the point. So watch your attitude. If you have an attitude of willingness, then it's not an intrusion. It's something you really want to be. Not because you must, but because you're willing to take on the job. That's the requirement of the job. I've known some people that were in pastoral ministry and they got out because they realized they really weren't looking forward to going to church on Sunday, which is a real bad thing when you're a pastor. They didn't really enjoy people calling them up, asking theological questions, or pastor needs you to pray about this, or concerned. They really weren't people persons. If you're not a people person, you're probably not going to want to do pastoral ministry. Now, I am not... Apparently, I am either not a counselor or I'm the best counselor in the world because generally people don't come back for a second session. So apparently whatever I say the first time really solves the situation. I would starve to death if I had to be a professional counselor because I understand repeat business is key in that department. You don't tell people, you know, well, yeah, I'd, that's the stupidest thing anybody's ever done. You shouldn't do that. Uh, you know, I had one lady came and wanted me to talk to her child because he was real upset with them, and she told me the way they treated him in the home, and I said, well, no wonder he's upset. Y'all are treating him terrible. Y'all are failing his parents, and apparently that wasn't the comeback answer, <laughs> but it was the truth. But watch your attitude. Am I in this for people, to try to help people? And try to deal with people. Second thing he says in that regard, not pursuing dishonest gain. Or in other words, we need to guard against greed. Let me catch up here. We need to guard against greed, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Why are you in the ministry? Why are you serving? Why are you taking an interest in this? Is it to gain money? There are some people who believe that going into the ministry is a way to get wealthy. And sad to say, for some people, it really is. They are making incredible amounts of money 
being in the ministry. Generally, it's people that are in the ministry that don't have a church. That's real interesting, how you can be in the ministry, but you don't pastor a church. You just sell tapes, run a TV program, run a radio program, send out a magazine, do these things, but you don't ever get involved in church ministry. To me, that's a red flag. You've got somebody that they're in the ministry, but they don't have a church. What, what ministry are you in? Now, I'm not saying that everybody that doesn't have a church that's in the ministry is in the wrong, but I'd say everybody that is in the ministry and doesn't have a church is a little suspicious and ought to be treated with some, let me see about this. It's not acquisition, it's anticipation. Eager to serve, can't wait to get with God's people. Not can't wait to get on the platform and have thousands of people hanging on every word and taking notes. No, it's the idea of just can't wait to see these people and interact with them and listen to what they're concerned about and talk to them and do those things. It's an eagerness to serve, so much so that you do it for free. By the way, most of these people who were elders, who were pastors in that day, did it for free. I've got some guys I really admire. And one of them is a guy that he's a, what uh, in Baptist circles they call bivocational. You know what bivocational means is he works a job so he can pastor a church. Starting a church, he's bivocational. He works in construction to make his living so he can start a church. That's bivocational. I'm doing the job so I can do what my avocation is. I really want to start a church. I really want to pastor a group of people. I really want to do that kind of thing. And I'm willing to pay the expenses in order to do that. Wow, that's impressive. There's a guy with a pastor's heart, a guy with a real concern about things. Great guy, great kind of person that says, hey, I really want to do this. Oh, you get paid for that sometimes too? Man, that's a icing on the cake. Wow, you mean you can actually get paid a living wage to do that? Well, maybe you can. If you're starting a church, you probably have to work for a living. But that's okay, and I get to, to take care of people too. And teach. Okay, that's good. Man, that's the attitude he's saying here. Not for dishonest gain, not because I can see, well, this is a way to make some easy money, but because you say, man, this is, this is really fun. Boy, if I had uh, the ability to live, this would be what I'd want to do. Uh, I'm really struggling with the concept of retirement because I don't believe you ought to retire unless you want to do something else. And I'm trying to think, now what would I want to do besides this? And that's a real problem. You know, a lot of people are retiring so they can do this. That's good. That's a good thing. I'm saying, hey, I really want to give my life for the church, for other people. That's what he's talking about here. Don't do it because you want to get dishonest gain because you're greedy for money. That's what dishonest gain means. But you're eager to serve. So these two kind of go together. You're going to put this thing together with the attitude, the right attitude toward it. It's about people. It's about caring for people. It's about the joy of being involved in people's lives. And it's not about the money. It's not about the gain of money. Doing it gladly. But you can also have the right attitude and you cannot be in it for money and you can still do it wrong. Look what he says, the third thing. Number three, verse three, not lording it over those entrusted to you but being examples to the flock. Not a boss, but an example. Some people are on power trips. When Jesus talked to his disciples, he said, don't be like the Gentiles. You know what Gentile rulers are like. They love to lord it over people. Uh, it'd be like me coming up to preach and you all having to stand because I'm here. You know, you must stand and recognize the man of God. Nah, that's not it. It's not the idea of being served. Well, Gentile rulers, they expected people to take care of them to show them great deference, to refer to them with exalted titles, to do for them rather than them doing for the others. 
Jesus said, that's not it. I want you to be a pattern, an example of service. An elder ought to be a person, a pastor, somebody involved in pastoral ministry, ought to be the example of somebody that you can point to and say, if you want to learn how to serve God by serving people, watch that person. Watch him. Watch her. If you want to know how to take care of a Sunday school class, watch this person. Observe how they're doing it. If you want to see what it means to lead an Awana group, to have the real servant's heart in Awana, watch this person. If you want to see what it means to be a teacher who cares about their congregation, their group, their class, their fellowship group, watch this person. They'll show you how it's done. You can watch them and imitate what they're doing and you'll learn how to do it. That's an elder. That's what we aspire to. This picture depicts a demeaning act that we don't do any day today because we wear socks and shoes. In those days when they wore sandals, anybody ever wear sandals a lot? Your feet get dirty. I grabbed off a bowl of chili right near my feet one time, and I was wearing sandals. Ugh, you know. But at least my toes were lubricated for the rest of the day. But it's kind of like, you know, uh, it's like I don't really know. And in those days when you wore sandals and you got dust and your feet got dusty and grimy and, you know, they had no cars. And if you were ritzy in those days, you either rode a horse or you rode a chariot or a conveyance that was carried by horses. And you don't have to put gasoline in horses. But when you put in oats and hay, you get output. (laughs) And when you're riding, driving your horse down the street, the output goes on the pavement. And so you got people that are walking in the house and their sandals are messed up and somebody dropped chili and somebody dropped something else. And so you would get a servant and you'd have that servant wash their feet off before they came into your house. It was just something. You didn't expect them to wash their own feet. Uh, besides, you don't really want them washing their own feet and then shaking your hand. You just let, let some dumb servant do that. And so they would get somebody... And as you came in the door, they would do this ceremony. They'd have a basin, and you take your, your sandals off, and you put a foot there, and this servant, who was at least smart enough to do that, would wash the feet, and they'd put the, dry it, and then you put the other foot up, and they'd wash that foot, and then they would dry it. And that's a pretty demeaning thing to have to do to somebody else. In order to teach leadership, Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, went around and did for the disciples what none of the disciples would do for one another. He washed their feet. Why did he do it? He said, because I, your Lord and Master, have done this to you. I've given you an example. Go do this for us. Don't go wash other people's feet unless they need washing. But go serve That's what pastoring, being a church leader, being somebody that's caring for and watching over a group of children, a group of learners, a group of adults, that's what you do. You go and you serve because that's the point. Now, if you can do that, then there's going to be glory in it for you. Let's talk about this not negatively but positively. An elder is somebody who is willing to watch over Christians and care about their soul. Number two, an elder is eager to give to meet the needs of others. They're looking for, how can I help this person? How can I add value to this person? How can I do something for this person rather than what can this person do for the church? What can this person do for me? What can I do to help this person? Now, obviously, We want people to be involved in the church. To be doing things in the church. Because you're not going to be happy if you're not involved. 
If you're not in Sunday school, if you're not serving, if you're not doing something to want or doing something in Sunday school, doing something in outreach, doing something to take care of things. If you don't have a ministry, you're going to be miserable because that's what idleness produces. But we're not looking for you to get involved so we can fill a slot. It's so you can be happy. And we're looking for how can I help this person to be involved? How can I contribute to this person? What can we do as a church to help this person? An elder is that kind of person. And finally, an elder is an example of faithfulness. We as the youth of the church ought to aspire to be good elders. We ought to be aspire to the place to where people can point to us and say, now if you want to know what it is to be a Christian, watch that person. Set that person as your example. Watch them. And by the way, for those who are my age and up, particularly up, there are people watching you to see how is this done. It's not just little kids running around watching. There are people who may be 10, 15, 20 years younger than you, and they're wondering, how do I get from where I am to where you are? How do I get from where I am to where you are? Don't really know how to do that. Don't see how I can get out of the situation I'm in. Will faithfulness really do that? Will faithfulness get me to that point? And they're watching you. And if they see it in you, they're going to remain faithful because they say, well, it works for them. It'll work for me as well. We are doing these things for people but we're also doing it for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Not just the crown of life, but a crown of glory and honor that will never fade away. It's not going to be some gold crown that's going to corrode and you've got to polish it all the time. It's going to be a recognition this person is honorable and it'll never be taken away. It'll never perish. And it'll be enough. If you never get paid a dime, in fact, if you have to spend everything you've got to be a pastor, to be caring, to be watching over other people, to take that responsibility, when you get that crown, you're going to say, man, it was all worth every bit of it. Worth all the trouble, worth all the difficulty, worth cost me everything I had is worth it. It's worth it. Next week, we're going to look at verses 5 and 6, verse 7, and say, if I'm younger and I've got older people over me, how do I survive that and thrive on being younger? Let's bow together in prayer. Lord, as we come into your presence to remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved us enough to give his life for us. We pray, Father, that you'll make us like him, that we'll recognize that only in giving our life is our life truly worthwhile. Father, if that's your will, that's what we want. And Lord, it is your will. You want us to be willing to give everything we have to you, to be used as you see fit. Father, there's someone here today, maybe discouraged, discouraged with their life, Lord, discouraged with their walk, Lord, maybe even not even saved. Is it worth it? Let them look to Jesus Christ and see he who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame that was associated with it but now is seated at the right hand and who has many people like us in whom he can glory and honor. We ask this for Christ's glory and his alone. Amen.